We are continuing in chapter 4 talking about the relationship between money and inflation. And in this chapter we're going to talk a little bit about the real interest rate. So first of all, let's just talk a little bit about real versus nominal. Let's, let's start out with defining this thing called the nominal interest rate. And we're just going to use the um, small letter I to represent the nominal interest rate. And that's an interest rate not adjusted for inflation. Most interest rates in the United States are nominal interest rates. They're, they're stated without any adjustment for price level changes. But sometimes we want to deal with something called the real interest rate. We want to know, well, what is the actual return to, in, to um, this investment or, or the, that I'm paying for this when I adjust for changes in price level? And I have to adjust for price, changes in price level with this interest rate because if we think about a loan, what happens? I'm paying, or I, I'm, I'm being, I'm borrowing money at today's price level. So money that's worth, say, if a loaf of bread is worth, is it costs one dollar. Say I borrow ten dollars, then I've borrowed the equivalent value of ten loaves of bread. But if I pay back tomorrow, I'm paying back the, no, I'll pay back the nominal value of ten dollars. But what if the price of bread goes up to, say, two dollars a loaf? Well, in that case, I'd only be paying back something that was worth five loaves or half as much. So, um, if my interest rate doesn't take into account that change in price level or change in the purchasing pr power of that money that's being paid back versus the money that was borrowed, well, then there's something missing in my measurement of the interest rate. And so we want to take that into account. And so we have this equation. This is called the Fisher equation. And that the real interest rate roughly equals the nominal interest rate minus the inflation rate. And you can think of it like this. What's going on is essentially, in intuitively, the real interest rate equals the nominal interest rate. That's how much the nominal overall value of your your um, investment or the money that's been put into this is going up. It's growing at. And, well, the inflation rate is how much it's being diminished by increases in prices. So, if I take this, this upward minus this downward movement, I get approximately what the real change in purchasing power is over time. So this thing is called the Fisher equation. It's named for Irving Fisher. I'm not going to go through the derivation of the Fisher equation. I do that in money and banking. But um, for right now, just realize that the real interest rate is approximately equal to the nominal interest rate minus the inflation rate. So start out with the Fisher equation. We, we, we have something to, well, really kind of confuse everything because we have a Fisher equation. We also have a Fisher effect. Right, okay, I know. Why why can't we come up with different names? Well, it's because the same guy, Irving Fisher, kind of is is responsible for both of these concepts. So if we begin with the Fisher equation, then we begin with this uh, then we move on to this idea that we had from chapter three that savings equals investment determines the real interest rate. Okay, so within that loanable funds framework that we created in chapter three, we got the real interest rate. Thus, uh, an increase in inflation causes an increase in the nominal interest rate. In other words, what I'm saying is that the real interest rate, R, is determined by, saving, by this loanable funds framework that we talked about. Essentially, it equates savings and investment, which is determined in Chapter 3, we see, independent of this price level or this inflation rate. And so we can say, well, this real interest rate is independent from the inflation rate. So if the inflation rate changes, the real interest rate isn't necessarily going to change, at least according to the models that we've developed so far. So if I have I, sorry, I'll use a better color. If I have um, the nominal interest rate equals the real interest rate plus the inflation rate, and I think the inflation rate goes up, but I don't think the real interest rate changes by very much. What has to happen? The nominal interest rate has to go up. And in fact, this Fisher effect says that there should be a pretty close to a one-to-one -one relationship between the inflation rate and the nominal interest rate. Okay.
This is called the Fisher effect. And if we plot out here, so what we have here is the orange line is the inflation rate. The blue line is a measure of a nominal interest rate. And we see they are very highly correlated with one another, which is exactly what, that, um, um, what the model predicts would happen. So the next thing we have to do is we have to think about the uh, real um, interest rate. And I, and I, well, I defined the real interest rate just a little bit incorrectly. Uh, I did that on purpose, actually. The real interest rate is really equal to, the real interest rate is approximately equal to the nominal interest rate minus expected inflation. Or your textbook actually uses the expectations operator, which is this capital E, um, which just means expected inflation. So if you'll remember the, the superscript E from so principles of macro or principles of micro referring to expectations. Okay, and the problem with that is, well, we've got to figure out how these expectations are determined. If we just assume that expectations are perfect or we have perfect foresight, we could just We'll get rid of this expectations and put in the actual inflation rate. But the problem is we don't have perfect foresight, and we don't always know exactly what's going on. And so we end up with, well, at least from our perspective in, the, in this class, two different versions of the um, um, expected inflation. All right, the first one is we're going to call this the ex ante real interest rate. That's the real interest rate people expect at the time they buy a bond or take out a loan. Okay, in other words, we have to put in this future expectation of inflation, and there could be, you know, several different ways. They may have a forecasting model to do this. They may have a heuristic model to do this. They may just assume it was what it was last period. Okay, there's a number of different ways that that can be determined. The next thing on this is what we call the ex post real interest rate. And that ex post real interest rate is the interest rate that's actually realized. So we actually put the inflation rate that we see in there. And both have both of these two interest rates have have um, important uses. Okay, that concludes our discussion of the real interest rate.